Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. My guest on today's show is Jennifer Stein, co-producer, writer, director, and developer of the multi-award-winning documentary, Travis, the True Story of Travis Walton. The film recounts uh, the now world-famous 1975 UFO abduction of Travis Walton and the impact the event had on his life over the intervening years and on the lives of his logging crew members. Jennifer Stein, welcome to Paranormal Yacker. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Stan. You, Jennifer, have stated that you believe film has the power to educate, inspire, and empower unlike any other medium. Your incredible body of work proves that. What was there about the Travis Walton case that inspired you to make a documentary about him and his fellow logging crew members? Stan, I had the pleasure of meeting Travis at uh, a Roswell conference that I was actually running with a good friend of mine, Peter Robbins. I was sort of his assistant for one of the 2010 Roswell UFO conferences in Roswell. A group of us had dinner after the conference was over. And Peter and I said to Travis, you know, your event is as significant as the Roswell event. And it's 20 years newer. You know, Roswell was 1947 in July. Yours is 1975. It's still now 45 years old. But at that point, it was like 40 years old, practically, uh, or no, even less, it was 35 years old. And we said, Travis, you should really have a conference in Snowflake or Heber or somewhere around that area. Peter and I started putting together the basic structure for him to have a 40th anniversary conference. And that's what stimulated the beginning of the making of this film. I was doing some film work already. I was doing some promotionary film work for other conferences. And I said, you know, I can put together a little promotionary thing. And then one thing led to another. And I did an in-depth interview with him and an in-depth interview with Richard Dolan. Then I had the opportunity to run a MUFON symposium in 2014 in Philadelphia. I was one of the key coordinators on that. So I rented a specific hotel room and interviewed a lot of the people who were going to be speakers there, which was people like Kathleen Martin and Lee Spiegel. We had Ben Hansen. And we had a number of people who were very familiar with Travis's case and the significance of it and the importance of it in ufology. And the more I began to interview these people, the more I realized it basically dropped on my lap. The documentary project dropped on my lap. And I thought Hollywood is only ever done a fictional version of this film. Nobody stepped up and done a good documentary. And I had already done an award-winning documentary film, and I decided to take it on as a challenge. Not really certain I could do it, but I was very grateful for a lot of people who showed up to help me. So there's a lot, as you see on the, on the back of the DVD, when people get it, there's a long list of co-producers and associate producers and people who really helped me uh, make sure my facts were correct, got me to various people and got me into archives and things like that, which I really needed the help for, of which was Stanton Friedman. He was a big mentor to me and really helped me quite a bit. So once I had the, you know, the pieces of the puzzle, it was just a matter of putting them together. But it took me a good five years to do it. I would, Jennifer, like to take my viewers to Ground Zero, the original site in the forest of Arizona, where Travis Walton was abducted by a UFO, an event witnessed by his fellow loggers. Could you tell me what transpired during those first few minutes and how the crew he was with described what they saw. For this logging crew, it was a typical end of the day event. These were loggers that worked in a team or a crew of seven, and they did what's called timber stand improvement. So they took care of uh, small saplings and dead trees that would be fuel for a mega fire that could happen with a lightning strike in a very dry season, like July or August when it's super hot in Arizona. And the area is the Sitgraves National Forest. It sits high on the Mogollon Rim, which is a large plateau about 7,000 feet high. And it is towards the northeastern corner of Arizona, not too far from the Four Corners region, which is Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. These areas all are four states that fit together. And there's almost like a cross like this where they all meet. So that's why they call it the Four Corners, because there are four equal corners where the states all come together. So this is in the north northeast corner of northern Arizona, high on the Mogollon Rim in the middle of the Graves National Forest. And I will say this is one of the largest ponderosa pine forests in the world. It stretches from parts of northeastern New Mexico, straight through eastern and northern Arizona, and straight on up into Utah and into Colorado.
Colorado. It's a huge area. It's thousands and thousands of acres. So they're um, doing their work. They're creating what they call slash piles, which is piles of wood to burn when it snows so that it protects the forest during the high fire seasons when it's very dry. And they were leaving work in an area called the Turkey Springs Valley or the Turkey Springs Basin. It's an area referred to as Turkey Springs because there's a natural spring there. And uh, they're on a forest road leaving in a work truck. And the forest road is not really a paved road. It's just an area where trees are cut down and you kind of have to, you know, there's no gravel, there's no pavement. You just kind of have to drive through the forest. But the people who work there know where it is. They're leaving the forest and they see up ahead of them, they're going uphill uh, to the top of, a, of the valley where they were working. And they see this odd light in the sky. And they think that the light is possibly a small plane which has crashed or caught fire or possibly a lightning strike with a top of a canopy of trees burning because it's bright and it's high in the canopy of trees as they're driving. It's not on the ground level where they are. Now, of course, they're going uphill and it's uphill from them, but they see it and they think it's odd. And then they think, well, maybe it's the moon because, you know, sometimes a bright moon rising, you'll see. But the moon was behind them, <laughs> you know, it was off to the opposite side and this was off to the right and the moon was off to the left. They said, let's hurry up and get up there and see what this is because they were prepared to jump out of the truck and try to do whatever they could if it was a small plane crash or try to go get help. So as they pull up to a clearing, there's a small hill to their right and they look up and a large tree had been cut the year before, probably a 300 year old tree. And it had a large canopy, which was now gone because the tree was cut, sitting in this canopy of the trees below the tops of the other trees around it in this 25 to 40 foot canopy clearing was a UFO sitting there. And it was a clear disc-shaped UFO. There's a good picture of it on the cover of this uh, DVD that people can see. I don't know if you can see that with the glare, but it was a typical disc shape with a round, slightly rounded bottom, you know, like two saucers put together, like two coffee, coffee saucers, and light was coming right through the craft. I mean, that the craft was illuminated. You could see the framing of the craft, and everyone in the truck saw it. They all encountered it, and they said, oh my gosh, it's a UFO, uh, and it was quite bright. It was sending a, a a light beam sort of across the pathway that they were driving through in the forest. The logging crew, they went to look for Travis and he was... Well, I'll I'll, I'll back I'll back up a bit, Stan. What I didn't tell you is what what happened next, which is uh, precedes your next question. So Travis is in the jump seat, his, which means he's in the front passenger seat of the truck. He flies open the door and jumps out of the truck and runs uphill about a hundred feet and stands right under this craft because he figures it's going to disappear any minute. And he is like he wanted a really good close up look at this thing because many UFOs had been spotted in this area over a number of years. And usually as soon as they're spotted, they disappear. And he was determined to get a really good look. So he jumps out, runs up, and is practically standing under this thing. When suddenly it begins to undulate a little bit more, there's sounds that start to come out of the craft. There's a static electric charge that begins to build up. Travis gets the feeling like something weird's going to happen. So he decides to squat down or kneel sort of behind a slash pile of logs, which had been placed there. A uh, few weeks before, as that logging crew had been working down its way through the valley. So he's kneeling sort of behind this pile of logs, which is kind of about maybe up to his, you know, chin or his nose. And he's trying to hide behind the logs and watch this craft. And the guys in the truck are saying, you know, Travis, get back here. What the, you know, what the hell are you doing? Like, get in the truck. Come on, let's get out of here. So Travis finally decides he should get up and go back to the truck. And he stands up. He actually kind of jumps up to run back to the truck. And at the moment he stands up, he gets hit with this beam, like a lightning bolt of charge comes out, like a beam. Some of the guys said it was like a blue beam, like you can see a hot beam when you turn on a gas stovetop. It's so hot, it's like blue. So this bright, like blue beam hits him and throws him, picks him up off the ground and throws him like, like he's been hit by a grenade or a, or a bomb, throws him about 15 feet behind him. He flies back in the air and he lands without any attempt to break his 
small. And the boys in the truck not only see this, hear it, but they feel it. It's such a force that Mike Rogers, the crew boss, said he could feel the force of it through his elbow on the door of the truck and through his hands on the steering wheel. All the boys felt it. It's sort of like when you're near a big band and the, the bass drum goes by and you feel the sound. So they were impacted by this and they were frightened and they assumed the craft was going to hit them next. So they slammed the door and drove away. They drove up the Turkey Springs Valley up to what's called a rim road, which is a gravel road, the way they used to get into work, thinking that maybe they needed to try to go get help. But, you know, sometimes there are other hunters and stuff driving along that rim road. They didn't know what to do. So they got in the truck and they drove up there. And then they stopped when they got to the rim road and said, oh my goodness, this is terrible. We got to go back and get Travis. We can't leave him there. We don't know if he's dead or alive. But the crew boss said, I got to go back. So he turns the truck around. He tells all the other crew guys, look, get out. You can wait here. And they're having an argument while they're turning the truck around. They're trying to figure out what to do. They're panicked. And they can see the craft because it's now below them, you know, because they went up higher on the ridge. They can look down in the forest. They can see the light. And what happens? The craft flies away. They see it. So they know the craft is gone. So then they all feel confident that they're going to go back and find Travis. No, it's not far. It's maybe a five minute drive, maybe eight minutes because it's a rough, you know, there's no road. They get back to the area with the truck. And it's dark now because they worked almost till dusk. Now it's dark and they can't find Travis anywhere. They get back to the spot and they know it's the spot because they can see where the truck tires had spun out. They kind of roughed up the ground and Travis was missing. Nowhere to be found. So that's that's the next important part of the story. When they did come back, when the logging uh, crew Travis was with were not able to find him, they had a panic, as you mentioned. What was going through their minds? They weren't sure what happened to him. They weren't sure if an animal showed up and tried to drag his body off, but they couldn't see evidence of that. They could see where he landed because they knew it because he, it, they think they that he might have hit a rock or something. They were afraid he, he was maybe alive and conscious and stumbling around the forest. They were looking for him. They turned the headlights of the truck, pointed up the hill so they could have more light to see because Travis had run up a small embankment about 100 feet. They didn't have a flashlight with them or if they had anything. It was one flashlight. The only thing they had is gas cans and electric, yeah, or I should say gas powered saws that they were using to cut the forest with. So they realized that after looking for him and calling for him for 40 minutes or so, you know, they burst into tears. They were crying. They were frightened. They didn't know what to do. They decided they had to go to town and report it to the police. And some of the boys actually had small misdemeanors in their growing up years, like, you know, they, one of them had picked up a car once and driven it around before he had a license. Another one had maybe some shoplifting experiences from a local grocery store or something. So they were like, oh no, now we're going to have police records. They're going to think we did something. But they had to report him missing and they had to report the trueness of the story. But they knew no one was going to believe him. And they were in such trepidation that they drove to town and called the police. They drove to the nearest town, which was Heber, went to a phone booth and called the local sheriff. When the members of Travis's group reported him missing to local authorities, how did those in law enforcement react to what they were told? I think they did the best they could, Stan. And this is something that my film really captures well, because I interviewed both Sheriff Marlon Gillespie and Deputy Chuck Ellison. How, what they thought and what was going on at the time, it was hectic. First, Marlon Gillespie gets the call and he said, sends out a sheriff or a, a deputy named Deputy Ellison, Chuck Ellison. And Chuck shows up, asks them to all wait right there at the gas station. And like, it takes them like 30 minutes to get there. These small towns out there in Arizona are all about 30 miles apart from each other. So about a half hour later, he shows up and he's walking around the truck. He's looking for alcohol. He's getting close to the boys, seeing if they're smoking marijuana. You know, what's going on? What do you mean you lost a member of your crew? It doesn't quite make sense. So he and another deputy named Copeland asked three of the boys to go back up into the forest with him that right then and there that night in the police car because they could put you know, three of them in the back. So three crew members agreed to go back and some of the other crew members took the work truck home and dropped off the other members of the crew because many of the crew did not want to go back. They were, they were scared to death to go back up into the forest. So the police and three crew drove back up to the forest. And by this time, it's like 8, 39 o'clock at night. And they're 
they're up there looking for two, three hours and they have flashlights and they're walking around the whole forest looking and can't find him anywhere. So they decide they're going to, one of the crew members and a police officer, they're going to go back to the main headquarters. One police officer named Copeland goes off with Mike Rogers to Travis's house where his mother is staying in, in a cabin, actually many, many miles away, but in the forest herself and says, your son is missing. We don't know where he is. And this is the story. And then a daybreak search opens up as soon as daybreak happens with about 40, 50 people up there looking for him. Navajo search and rescue, other police force members are there. There's people on horseback. Uh, gradually, eventually, as the days went on, they looked for him for five days and couldn't find him. So it was quite uh, traumatic. And, and what also happened to the crew is the police suspected them, of course, of murdering Travis. So they all went under individual interrogations during the search. They were all required to show up and be part of the search for five days. And each of them was assigned a deputy who at some point during the day pinned what these work crew members against a tree at some point and said, just tell us where the body is. Because you may not have done it, but if one of your crew members killed Travis and you don't come forward and tell us, you're considered a co-conspirator and you could be, you could go to jail or face the electric chair if Travis is found dead. So you might as well just tell us where you hid the body because you're going to jail. So the boys were really petrified. How long after his abduction was Travis found? Where was he found? And how did he describe what he experienced aboard the flying saucer on which he was abducted? The boys were part of the search for five days and they eventually underwent lie detection tests through, uh, sponsored by the Arizona police force. They brought in the chief Arizona lie detection person. So that was going on on Sunday, I believe. It, Travis went missing on a Wednesday and the following Sunday, it was either Sunday or Monday because he was gone five days. The boys underwent lie detection and they all passed. Now, Travis didn't really remember much at all. He, of course, knew he stood up to run back to the truck and he remembered that part. But midway through this process, he wakes up on board a craft and he thinks he's in a hospital. He wakes up and he's going in and out of consciousness. He's in a lot of pain in his chest. He can hardly breathe. He can't see. It's like his eyes can't focus. He was probably had a major shock, a, maybe some sort of electrical or, you know, we don't know what, what type of impact hit him, but the energy was so strong. It completely knocked him out. Maybe it even killed him. And maybe he was being brought back to life is what many people believe. He knew there were people around him. He thought they were people caring for him. And when he could barely begin to focus his eyes and see, he thought he was around doctors with like surgical caps on and masks because he, he saw these eyes looking at him and he saw what looked like he thought was a surgical cap and a mask. But then he finally realized when his eyes could focus that these were like gray aliens standing around him. And he got freaked out when his eyes could finally focus. And he he does have an experience. He remembers on board this craft where he rolls off a table he's on. He tries to, he looks for medical devices, which he sees. He tries to flail some of these medical devices at these beings. These beings pick up their hands and try to like mentally lock onto him and calm, maybe calm him down or maybe control him. But probably because of the electrical malfunctions that had gone on in Travis's brain or his whole electrical circuitry in his body, he just was in a panic and screaming and yelling at them. So they gave up and walked away. Travis then follows them out after they disappear out of this room he was in. And he was trying to find his way out of, out of a craft. There's a little more to that story, but I will tell you what happens is to kind of cut the story short. And, you know, people may want to watch the film or go to the website because there's more details about this on the website. He finally meets someone who he thinks looks human. Someone comes into the craft to get him and he has a blue jumpsuit on and a helmet on. And he, Travis thinks it's an astronaut. He thinks NASA's come to get him because he looks human. And he takes Travis by the arm, walks him out of this disc, down a, a ramp. Travis can turn around and see the same craft, although it's not lit up, but it's a gray metal disc shaped craft about 20 feet in diameter. He walks off the craft, walks across what Travis describes as an indoor tarmac, like a hangar where you would put airplanes, except there are other craft in there. Not the type of craft he got off of, but other unusual craft that looked like large eggs or large beans, silvery beans or tic tacs, you might say. So anyway, he walks by these other craft. He goes into what he thinks is some kind of medical facility. He meets other people that look human and they basically try to get him down on a table and throw a gas mask.
mask over his face. L what looks like a gas mask, except it's not attached to anything. There's no, you know, cables that come out of it, but they force him down and they force him out. They don't want him to be asking questions, I guess. And the next thing Travis remembers is he wakes up on the side of a street outside of the town of Heber, which is the closest town to where he was taken from the forest. He wasn't returned to the forest. That was a 45 minute switchback hike way up on top of the Mogollon Rim where he would have possibly frozen at, you know, 32 degrees in November, uh, way up high in the forest. He couldn't, he wouldn't have had the energy to get down for help. There's no homes or businesses up there. So they left him right on the side of the street about a quarter mile outside of the small town of Heber where there were some phone booths. And Travis wakes up on the side of the street. He sees a light around him. He looks up to figure out what, you know, where's this light? Where am I? Because there are no street lamps in the town of Heber. At least there weren't in 1975. And he looks up and he sees this light zip up into the bottom of a craft and the same type of craft he saw in the forest zip off and take off. And he realizes he's on the side of a road and he starts walking downhill, doesn't really know where he is, but he sees lights out in front of him. So the small town of Heber was in front of him. So he walked out, down into town and made a phone call. Realizing where he was, he called his sister and brother-in-law who lived closest to the town of Heber. And he asked them to come pick him up at the phone booth. Interestingly, this was a collect call. And it was the time where you got an operator and you asked the operator to make a call for you. And the operator stayed on the phone and heard that it was Travis and called next the police to tell the police that Travis was back. Fairly, really fascinating. Should viewers of Paranormal Yacker want to buy your documentary, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, and find out about events you'll be at, how can they do that? I think the best website to go to is just called TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. So it's just his name and the word TheMovie.com. And when they get there, they can see that they can buy the film as a DVD still if they, if they want to. It's also now on Amazon Prime. So if people have Amazon Prime, they can watch it actually for free or they can watch it on Amazon, pay for it. I think at $2.99 or $3.99 to watch. And we've done it with subtitles. So if people are hard of hearing, they can click on the subtitle option. It's also now available in multiple languages, which is what I had worked on in the five years since the film came out. We have it in uh, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, I believe it's in Italian, and um, Japanese. And we're working on a Greek version as well. So people can watch it, the transcription on the bottom in Greek. It's not in, it's not spoken in that language, but it's the transcriptions on the bottom. There's also many things on that website. People can look and see about some of the current debunking that was going on. And they can watch some little videos that sort of dispute the current debunking because people have actually taken parts of the film, illegally copied it, put it up online and things like that, which they're probably not supposed to be doing, but is happening. There are many different ways to, to learn about the film. And yes, I do do speaking engagements and screenings with the film periodically. Conferences ask me to come and do that. Plus I speak on many other subjects as well, like some ancient sites and things. I'll be speaking at a conference in Lachlan, Nevada in just uh, about three weeks from now at the Starworks conference. I'll be speaking on Gobekli Tepe. And I've I'm, I'm also been asked to speak on a cruise. It's a hidden a, a, a hidden secrets cruise, which is uh, going out of California in April. And that's very fun. So information about that is up on uh, my website, as well as On Wings Productions. That's a personal site for my production company at O-N-W-I-N-G-E-S productions.com. So they can go there and learn more about me too. Jennifer Stein, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. It was a pleasure yakking with you. It's a pleasure to meet you, Stan, and to connect. I'm sorry I never, uh, you know, did a face-to-face -face interview with you when I was in or near Hamilton or Canada, but maybe that will happen in the future. You never know. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Jennifer Stein. In part two, I'll be talking with her about her first-hand interviews with key players in the UFO abduction of Travis, including Travis himself and the role of so-called skeptics such as journalist Philip Klass, who was used by the FBI and other government agencies to use his influence on other journalists to debunk UFO sightings and abductees, so that you don't miss it, have access to past interviews, and be amongst the first to receive new interviews when released. Be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. To do that, 
that, just press the subscribe button on your screen.